Good evening, everyone, and a warm welcome to another SGA online lecture. Before we kick this off, uh, first of all, I would like to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Kristina. I'm from the Serbian Games Association team, and I will be your hostess and moderator for this evening. Uh, before we move on to the main part, uh, just a few technical information so we can uh, communicate more effectively. Uh, in case this is your Zoom uh, first Zoom webinar, uh, at the bottom of the screen, uh, you can find a couple of uh, useful tools for uh, talking to us and amongst each other. Uh, first, there is the chat option, uh, which you can use for you know, more informal greetings. Uh, I invite you to, even as we speak, introduce yourselves. Uh, we would love to hear, are you a game designer or maybe a team lead, or um, whether you are in the gaming industry already or you would like to join it uh, in general, what drew you to this event. And of course, um, you can uh, talk to each other in the chat option and you know, feel free to consider this uh, sort of an online networking tool. Uh, uh, since we are here virtually. Uh, besides the chat option, there is the more formal Q&A section. And here you can uh, post all of the questions you would like uh, us to ask our uh, speaker tonight. And in case your question uh, is regarding the presentation itself, we can ask it right away. Uh, if it's a more general question, we will leave it for uh, the end of the session for the Q&A part. But um, be sure that all of your questions will be answered and are more than welcome. Uh, so uh, I would like to uh, slowly introduce our speaker tonight, uh, although he doesn't need a special introduction. Um, I think he is uh, one of the few people uh, globally that can uh, talk to you about game design from the perspective of someone uh, who has worked on uh, projects of, of this magnitude and of uh, such continuous success. Uh, of course, we are talking about Playrix's Gardenscapes, which is to date their most uh, successful game in terms of revenue and a number of players uh, and I'm sure he will have a lot of uh, useful information for you and it's really a unique uh, opportunity to you know peek behind the game dev, game dev curtain and uh, ask him anything uh, you would like and in case you are wondering yes this uh, presentation is being recorded and in case you are late or you have to leave early uh, the entire presentation will be uploaded online for your viewing pleasure uh, so Dmitri good evening uh, I uh, invite you to uh, unmute yourself and uh, start your webcam. And if everybody is okay with it, uh, we can kick this off. Good evening. Nice to be here. Sorry. Uh, uh, yeah, your mic was up. Yeah, uh, we can move on to your share screen option. You can tell us a bit more about yourself and then we can mm -hmm. move on to the main part. Okay. So, uh, the title of our presentation today is Game Design in Playrix. And I'll start first with the uh, introduction of myself. My name is Dmitry. I am from Vologda, Russia. It's the uh, birth town of Playrix. Uh, um, I'm in game design since 2011, 2010, something like that. Uh, so, for almost 10 years, I've been a game designer. And uh, before that, I was a lawyer at the same time practicing uh, making quests in the real world. It's an interesting part of discussion and so on. And that essentially led me to becoming a game designer. Uh, and I started my career in Playrix and I'm still there. So for the last 10 years, I've been working, working in Playrix. And actually my favorite part about it is uh, reading messages from recruiters on LinkedIn, because they, uh, a few of them start with the word something like, Playrix has had you for too long, come join us. So maybe Playrix really has had me for too long, but yet still I'm here. I worked on several projects throughout my career in, uh, in this company, uh, including a couple of downloadable games, uh, you can see them on the screen. And uh, later I turned to mobile games uh, together with the company and uh, mostly worked with uh, projects called Township and Gardenscapes. I also had some time spent in cross project field doing mostly uh, cross promotion between our games. Uh, right now I am a lead game designer in uh, on Gardenscapes and my responsibilities uh, lie in the field of what we call 
a general game design. So uh, I mostly work with the new features and not with uh, like level design, narrative design, and so on. Though I know a thing or two about narrative design since I started my career as a narrative designer. And the smallest part of my expertise uh, lies in the field of match three, but uh, I also am familiar with that. And I know that a lot of people, perhaps those of you who are present here today, they want to know more about match three in Playrix. So I uh, prepared a few slides about that as well. So let's uh, talk a little bit about our plan today. I thought this picture suits perfectly this slide. Actually, I've been using a couple of pictures made uh, by members of our team uh, just uh, as a part of the internal competition for making interesting pictures with characters of gardenscapes. So what we are going to talk about today, uh, I'll start brief about gardenscapes in general, what type of game is that? and talk a bit about meta, about match tree. And uh, then I'll switch to some information about the procedures uh, and the structure of our team. Um, you might think that uh, stuff about procedures and structure is not related with game design, but I assure you it has a huge influence on the game design because it's the way the decisions are being made, the way we get new ideas, the way we make them into a final product. So it's a very important part of game design as well. Let's start with Gardenscapes as a game. Recently, it's celebrated four years uh, since the release. So it was released on August, uh, 2016. And now it has a daily active user base of uh, around 10 million people, more than 10 million people on all the platforms, including iOS, Android, uh, Amazon, and others. And the team right now has more than 200 employees working at the, the same time on this project. Uh, so, when we started the development of Gardenscapes back in somewhere around 2013, it was a hidden object game. And in two years, we decided to uh, switch to Match 3. And we released it as a Match 3 game in 2016. And when we released it, it became the first Match 3 with Meta. Uh, before that, all the leading Match 3 games on the market had just a simple level map and player moved through this level map. Uh, they had no characters, no narrative, no anything. And Gardenscapes basically introduced a new way of looking at puzzle games. So besides completing levels, player can immerse in the garden restoration and the complex storyline with lots of characters. Uh, let's talk a little bit about meta as a part of Gardenscapes. Uh, it is the game is known for its recognizable main character with his pets, friends, and lots of relatives. Uh, Austin and his friends are very much unique in the field of mobile games and games in general, because uh, he's a, a balding, slender, and middle-aged man, not really a role model in the sense of early computer games with. Uh, computer and mobile games with uh, brutal male characters, uh, all kinds of uh, soldiers shouting on the icon of the app. So he's unusual, but still likable. And uh, he's a bit clumsy at times, He, uh, but he's always eager to help everyone. And he has a very positive attitude. Austin doesn't have any enemies or villains, only temporary rivals, and even those rivals in the end, they uh, basically end up on Austin's side of the story. Uh, as I've said, uh, the game has a very positive storyline. Uh, of course, some disasters happen every once in a while, but even those disasters, they end up with something good. Like for example, when a tree falls down and breaks the fountain, 
and Austin has to repair it with the player. And so after the player spends a couple of stars to repair it, it becomes even better than it was before the, this disaster. So it's always a positive feedback for a player. And of course, renovations. Uh, I specifically stressed this thing because uh, renovations became a huge thing, thing after Garden Escapes. Uh, personally, I'm not really sure whether renovation is uh, the driver of the game. I think it is partly the driver, but it's uh, surely the combination with match three. But maybe they are, and uh, they provide a positive element as well. And lots of clones that appear on uh, different stores nowadays, clones of Gardenscapes, they seem to be sure that renovation is a selling point. And uh, you can even find, if you look uh, on the App Store, you can find lots of games that uh, have a subgenre noted as a renovation puzzle game. So it even became a separate genre. Uh, let's talk a little bit about Match 3. There is a conspiracy on the internet that levels are made by AI and neural networks, they are artificially created. But in fact, I want, to, I want you all to know for sure that every level is handmade. So uh, there are almost 8,000 levels right now in Gardenscapes and each one of them was handmade. It might seem a little bit easier to invest in artificial ways of creating levels, but in fact, uh, such artificial levels we definitely lack the feel we intend to put in them. Uh, we do a careful calibration with uh, thorough play testing of every level before its release. So we have a special team of employees whose, uh, whose job is just to play the levels over and over. And through this extensive play testing, we get the initial idea on the level's difficulty, which uh, the difficulty is basically the number of tries divided by the number of successful tries, or I think vice versa. So anyway, uh, we have uh, initial idea on the difficulty. And then after the release, we gather the actual information from the actual players and uh, kind of calibrate it even more for the level to um, to be set in the difficulty curve the way it was supposed to be. Every, uh, well, there is a strict and thorough set of rules for level designers for using every element in the game, every element and every goal, uh, which means that every element um, kind of is appraised from the perspective of whether it can or cannot be used with any other elements, and especially if it cannot be used with other element. So there are some strict prohibitions about the combining of certain elements, the combination. And just to be clear, we have over 70 or even 80 levels and mechanics. So we can imagine how thorough those rules are because every element is compared to all the others. Um, and we have this thing called the idea of the level. So every machine level has an idea. Uh, and uh, this idea means that the level has something that separates it from all the others and creates the unique feel. And this feel comes from the, the way the mechanics are used, the way these mechanics are combined in the level, the visual part of the level, how it looks, uh, the usage of bonuses and so on. And here I have a small, but very straightforward example of the anniversary level number 2000, which starts with, uh, with a field of colored boxes forming the letter GS. And you have only one preset match by, uh, of combining those two rainbow blasts in the corner. And it destroys the whole field, revealing the number 2000 under the boxes. And then another rainbow blast 
to continue the plane. So I want to talk a little bit more about these ideas uh, with another example. Uh, some level has some level have a winning strategy, so uh, which kind of might not be straightforward for certain players. But when the player gets this idea, this winning strategy, they start to address this level in the uh, not like the field with obstacles, but as a problem to be solved. To solve. Um, in this example, you have a very small field at the bottom where you can make matches and try to break through multiple levels of dirt. But in fact, there are there is an element called a lawn mover which has to be filled by matching red pieces. And if a person will focus on matching red pieces, soon the, the topmost uh, lawn mover will be filled. It will destroy all the boxes at the top and more pieces will fall from, from the top, uh, filling the level and uh, increasing the area where a player can operate. So uh, it is good to have such levels and they're definitely cannot be made using any kind of AI instruments. So uh, Dmitry, if I can uh, mm -hmm. just um, ask you a quick question from Orkun that uh, relates to what you were just uh, talking about. Uh, how do you decide the right amount of tries for a level and, and gauge uh, the difficulty? Mm -hmm. Well, first the level is being created and uh, well, there are different approaches to this, but usually the level is supposed to be somewhere in the difficulty curve. So it's supposed to be either a simple level or a hard one. And judging by that, judging by what kind of level we need right now for this new level release, we will just uh, calculate the amount of uh, moves needed for this level. And this calculation, of course, at first, is like almost random, but then through the play testing, we decide whether it's enough or not, whether we should uh, make it higher or lower. Great, thank you. So it is a, a specific science in a way. And we have another question from Lana. Uh, she wondered uh, which uh, KPIs are you looking at uh, in terms of levels when you want to determine the balance and how often do you tweak them? Uh, once again, we are focusing mostly on the, on the difficulty of the level. So it's basically the main uh, KPI, the difficulty being the number of tries divided by the number of uh, successful tries. And it's just the, the strategy for us is to form this difficulty curve in a way that suits us, suits our strategy at this point. And uh, yeah, basically that's, well, that's the basic KPI we're looking at, but sometimes there are other KPIs like uh, how many uh, how many boosters does the person usually use to complete this level? Uh, does a person uh, uh, does does a person buy extra moves in the end of this level? And it is not necessarily for us to make every level highly monetized, obviously, because if every level would require an extensive use of hard currency, it will be bad for us because people would just leave the game. It's not interesting for them. So we make some levels easy and that does not require boosters. Other levels, uh, we might tweak a little bit so a player would be more, uh, will be less reluctant to, to use boosters and to use extra moves. Uh, great, you actually uh, gave a good intro to another question related to levels we have. Uh, how do you project the difficulty curve and do you factor in paywalls uh, into the equation as well? And if so, uh, is uh, the curve exponential or does it have a peak? It's a question from Intrax. Well, you, <laughs> this is getting a little bit harder for me to answer. Not because I don't want to spoil anything, but uh, I'm not that much deep in the level design. Uh, the thing I know that, of course, this difficulty curve is just the peaks and the plateaus when the player is comfortable. So uh, in every situation, we decide 
whether this part of the curve should be highly peaked or with uh, one or two peaks at the moment. Mm, understood. Okay. I'm guessing we could have a, a totally separate lecture just about level design. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's so whole, uh, whole of course. Mm -hmm. So feel free to move on with the presentation. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So another example of the idea uh, here, we have a very kind of hard and tight level at the beginning, but uh, there is this element called um, conveyor which are the lily pads in the water and after each move they after each move the player does the pads also move uh, on one one position and so when a player performs any kind of move the first one those lily pads uh, reveal the path for pieces to fall and to fill the other parts of the level so it's kind of at first looks hard, but then a player realizes, and actually in this in this uh, situation, a player cannot realize in advance when he first sees this level, he cannot realize that this would happen. And when he makes the first move, he realizes that the level is much more easier than it looks at the first glance. And sure, I'm not saying that every level has a cool, unique idea. It, definitely is not so but and some of them are just more simple more straightforward and not all of them are about strategy or about the fuel but we try to make uh, more of those levels as possible as more as possible as much as possible and a little bit more about match three we have this concept of seasonal elements and goals well, basically, uh, all the elements in the game, and as I've said, there are more than 70 of them, they are divided in actually three, but let's make it two big groups, uh, basic elements and seasonal elements. Basic elements can be used on any level, and they can be combined almost in any way, and they are easy to play with. So uh, we don't consider them like there are no rules about using them. But seasonal elements, they have higher concentration of them. We have higher concentration of them on specific sets of levels. So a season is a set of level with higher concentration of certain hard elements and goals. And for example, this uh, set of levels uh, from 3551 to 3700 has three preset seasonal elements, stones, mushrooms, and ivy. They appear on exactly these amounts of levels, this amount of levels, stones on 19 levels, mushrooms on 17 levels, and ivy on 20 levels. And it means that these elements would appear uh, a bit less on neighboring sets of levels. So there is no prohibition to use them at all, but just the concentration of them is high on this set of levels. And uh, on the other side of levels, there will be uh, another uh, seasonal elements. What it helps us to achieve, it produces uh, fresh emotions in players and the feeling of change. So when a player uh, goes from one level to another, uh, they definitely notice that recently they've been dealing a lot with a certain element like with the mushroom. And after a while, they realize they, oh, the mushroom is gone. Now I have to deal with something, something else. So these patterns, uh, players notice this pattern and it really brings uh, a certain feel to the game uh, on the whole. And certainly it reduces chaos a lot because uh, just random assignments of elements is definitely not a thing we should be looking at. And it provides an opportunity to learn because every new element we introduce in the game is being introduced in the way of seasonal element. And so after the introduction, a player has around 100 levels to learn how to use this element. Um, so maybe it's a little bit hard to grasp this idea of seasonal elements but you can probably 
rewatch it <laughs> in the uh, recording and maybe uh, take a closer look at the presentation afterwards. And so match three is actually a very long story. Uh, it definitely needs a, a webinar of, of its own. I have a, a colleague of mine actually made a presentation on specifically match three. You can Google it using this keyword players creating levels and elements for match three games. The, um, the key notes of this presentation, uh, they are available in text form, so you can find it. And it's also a very small part of information about match three because there are specialists much more um, acquainted with this topic than I am. And while you're refreshing yourself, maybe it's a good chance to uh, ask another question. We have, uh, just in short, uh, is pacing accounted for in a game like Gardenscapes? Because pacing is usually something we mention in terms of uh, AAA and indie games uh, with a you know specific mechanic. Uh, pacing, you mean in kind of the flow that they're getting? Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh -huh. uh, when are the more difficult and easier parts uh, interchanged and what's this mm -hmm. rhythm for the player? Yeah, once again, it's all about the difficulty curve. <laughs> it can be boiled down to the difficulty curve because it takes into account uh, everything of that. So the difficulty curve is also made up of peaks and the moments when the player can relax for a while. So it's definitely taken into consideration. Pacing is uh, very important. We almost never use uh, like two or three uh, hard, really hard levels in a concession. So yeah. Thanks, it, that's, it, it is that's a good answer, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. We can move on and if there are any questions, I will let you know. Okay, so now uh, let's take a closer look on the product and the structures and all the procedures, uh, I promised you. <laughs> so uh, the product, uh, as I've said, it might not seem about game design, but it actually is. And I'm not going to talk about the art department, uh, QA, uh, localization, community management, etc., because it is not related with level design, with game design. I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be only talking about game design perspective. And uh, actually, this is somewhat new. I don't think it has ever been announced publicly yet. This new change we had recently in the our, our operation procedures. So uh, recently, Gardenscapes became well. Before that, it was a project. We called it project inside our company. So now it became a product uh, which is divided into three separate projects. The first project is called Garden. It's all about storyline, quests, new expansions, and overall meta. Second project is called Events. It's uh, redesign events, uh, expeditions that were added recently, and the Gold Pass. Uh, those events that are usually repeated. And the last project is called Features. Uh, it's all about developing new features. Uh, it means that some new feature might later be transferred to events or garden project. And so uh, every project has a manager of its own, a producer and a set of teams. So before that, the whole Gardenscapes had uh, one, sometimes two project managers, a couple of producers and all the teams uh, in the same kind of area. And now there are three separate projects. Why we did that? Because it just helps us a lot to deal with production because the game is constantly growing. We are uh, we kind of focusing on releasing more um, on releasing bigger updates, more events, more new features, stack into one update every uh, month and a half. So it definitely helps the production 
this division inside the product. And it definitely helps producers and uh, managers to maintain the project. So now we have more producers who are able to focus on the single parts of the product instead of uh, kind of uh, separating their attention between everything. And you can imagine the Gardenscapes is very big as a product. Uh, so personally, I am on the features project and uh, I am responsible for creating new features. Um, now let's talk a little bit about our teams, how we do stuff, how we actually produce. Uh, me, we call this, uh, we have this concept of mini team, which means a small team, obviously, usually made up of uh, from five to 10 people, something like that. And this mini team is maybe a small project inside a project. You can think of it this way. Mini team is making a single feature, a single thing. Uh, sometimes, of course, uh, one team can be making several features if they are small enough. And it always has a team lead who is responsible for managing the team. A guy, uh, well, not necessarily a guy, a guy or a gal who's called responsible for quality. It's a very strange name. And actually when I translate it in, into English, it sounds, it sounds even stranger though in Russian too. Uh, and uh, programmers, artists, sometimes QA specialists. And each mini team is more or less independent and self-sufficient, which means that each team is should be able to produce a result without the help of other teams and it has enough specialists for that so uh, we have a set of teams some of them are big some of them are small and we have features and so when those features are divided between teams manager decides whether big feature should go well more likely to the big team with more programmers more artists and just more high level specialists and also it means that we have high level specialists who are also divided, who are also uh, who have a designated team. So sometimes we have, uh, for example, a, um, a lead programmer or even an art producer on the team who has to deal with small tasks as well. Some of them don't really like it, but actually it helps a lot with the production as well. So when an art producer has to draw an icon. It can be tricky with them, but usually they produce a good result without uh, lots of iterations as well. And this structure also helps specialists to grow a lot. And the thing we are doing right now, very often, we are including non-game designers into game design tasks. For example, we have programmers who can learn how to be a game designer, which happens quite a lot. We have QA specialists. Any kind of specialist from the team can become a game designer. Well, obviously not everyone should try being a programmer without certain background, but it can also happen. So let's talk a little bit about this person who is responsible for quality. I get a great picture. Certainly I'm not an artist and I should never try those tasks. Uh, this responsible for quality person is usually a game designer, but as I said, sometimes uh, programmers can do that and other people as well. And we think of them as mini producers, which means that they perform tasks, they, uh, they are assigned with tasks that usually are the responsibility of the producer but on the smaller level inside the team. So they are kind of producers for the team. They're responsible for writing design documents, obviously, and making sure everyone understands the design document. It is also always a big problem. Uh, they control the development process. They give feedback on art and actually on every work other people on the team do. They are constantly watching the new build of the game. Well, I think, uh, I mean, basically it's uh, the stuff for game designers to do. So they 
give feedback, they approve everything with the producer, they do the balancing if needed inside the game, although the game like Township has a special game designers for balancing because it's all about the balance. But in Garden Escapes, it can be done with uh, responsible for quality. They uh, make sure the result corresponds to the initial idea. And this, this is a big thing because the initial idea, the, the top management, for example, had for the feature can be very different from what is being made. And it is the responsibility of this person to making sure it does not, uh, the focus stays on the initial idea. They are controlling the launch, they are analyzing the results after the launch, and they are updating the design document during and after the development. And one of the things those people do, they give feedback for other teams and for other responsible for qualities. Uh, so, while we're sorry at the mm -hmm. topic of a design document, uh, it seems it's very popular with our viewers uh, tonight. So can you tell us some more about the design document and uh, is there a template you could share maybe not from the player team uh, evidently, but you know like a general template that people can use? Uh, I think I maybe should rather talk about it a little bit later. I have a slide that's somewhat dedicated to this sphere. So that's great, even mm -hmm. better. Cool. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, so what is quality in general? Because it's a very important thing, obviously, and didn't has a special person who's responsible for it. Uh, quality is a state of the feature when everyone who reviewed this feature agree on some basic things. The thing is being played the way it was supposed to be played. As I've talked uh, earlier, it is important to uh, maintain the vision, the initial vision, or to modify it during the development. And the next very important for us, at least part of the quality, is the way the feature looks. So it's, it's supposed to look not just okay or good enough, but precisely good. It is very important. And we do a lot of, uh, we have a lot of examples when the feature was not released just because the uh, the UI or the art were off a little bit. So it's uh, it's a thing we we do a lot in Playrix. It's a thing uh, how we manage the game design. We focus a lot on the visuals. So we polish it up to the point when it's really good. It's very important. And so, Coming to, coming to this uh, idea of the development process and design documents. It all starts with the idea that usually comes from somewhere up top, kind of as a part of the strategic decision for the development process. Uh, like for example, someone uh, like uh, some executive producer might decide we are making uh, battle passes for all of our games. So this is the idea that comes to the team and we are doing it, every project. Then the idea is turned into a concept or straight to the design doc. So a concept, the difference between the concept and the design doc can be defined as following. The design doc is the very thorough representation of the feature with all the details, including all the description of the art, the UI, sounds, uh, the, um, I don't know, the analytics, everything. So the, a design document is a document based on which a team can be able to implement the feature from, from beginning to end. So the design document is the most thorough, thorough representation of the feature. And concept, which might not exist in certain cases, is a, a short version of the design document, so to say, without details. Concept is a thing we would, approve, we would discuss between producers. We would prepare it to be discussed between producers. It kind of um, makes the idea more developed it has some th 
things about how the, the feature should be operated, how it works in certain situations, or what kind of situations is the feature intended to be used. And concepts, sometimes they have uh, the, the interfaces and the art as well. If the whole feature is about uh, making something important for the UI, for example. So um, I don't know if I'm being clear about the design document. And if I answer those questions, we don't have anything like a template because uh, it highly depends on the feature. But most of the time, the template is, it can, can think of the template. So it's just the description of the, the, the short description of the feature, uh, the thorough description of the mechanics, then balance, for example, if needed, and then a lot about art and UI, kind of, and the behavior of the UI. What happens when a player clicks here? What kind of art pops up when the player enters the game, and so on. So after the design document is ready, it goes into production, the team does the feature, and at some point of the development, the feature goes on the internal review. The internal review is interesting concept. I don't know if any other companies have stuff like this specifically, but internal review is uh, done by the producer of the project and, uh, and people who are responsible for quality on the teams related with this project. So here is a moment when all the game designers can watch, can look at the work that was done by other game designers and give feedback. It's, uh, of course, I mean, it's very important. I think everyone understands that because uh, when the feature is being done inside the team, it is always hard for them to look at it with fresh set of eyes. Uh, so at this moment, when the feature cannot be yet fully completed, it goes on the internal review. After that, certain changes are made and the feature goes on external review, which is at which point the feature should be 100% done. Of course, it doesn't happen sometimes, but we tend to, we try to make it 100% done for the external review. And it is being done with uh, all kinds of producers. We invite producers from other projects, from other products, they look at the feature, they analyze the initial idea, they analyze the way the concept was made. Does the result correspond to the initial idea? Everything is decided on this external review. And basically the decision is being made whether the feature should be released in the world. If everything's okay, it goes on submit and release. Um, a few words about what is okay. And what is not okay uh, at this moment of development. So what is okay? It is okay to move the feature to the next update if the quality is less than was expected. So when everyone, or at least most of the people who review the feature agree that the game design is not the way it was expected to be performed. Like the quality is less than was expected. Uh, at this moment, the feature should be moved to the next update. And we do this quite a lot. So uh, I can, I, I don't think I can think of an example when a feature was uh, planned for a certain update and from the very first time actually made it to this update. It's usually moved to the next one, even though the initial idea of it was kind of simple. It looked simple, something always goes wrong. And also at this moment of development it is okay to adjust the vision. So the, as I said, the initial idea and maintaining this vision is very important through the development, but this vision can be adjusted. It is okay. I mean, if people decide that the new vision is also good, then why not adjust it? And what is okay-ish, meaning it is probably not a good thing to happen, but if it happens sometimes, every once in a while, it is okay. 
sometimes we release the feature anyway, even if the quality is a little less than was expected. So it's a, if it's a little less, then sometimes it is okay to release it this way. But with uh, very important uh, changes to be made for the later, later update, at least sometimes it is okay to try to launch it, maybe in an A-B test of a sort, a small one, just to be sure the feature works good. So sometimes it's not necessarily to polish it 100%, like 90% can be enough. And in regards to uh, these tests, we have a question from Radovan. Uh, does external review that you mentioned include soft launch in some markets? Do you test for markets specifically? Um, well, we had an example, we had a few examples when we made a soft launch at the small market. Uh, it's actually not really related with the uh, external or internal review, but it can be decided that a certain, a very new feature, which never existed in the game, can be soft launched in a small market. Uh, I remember we did this, we did this with uh, when we first released Glance and Chat in Township. Township was the first game that had uh, communities of players and the chat for them to communicate with each other. And we first soft launched it in, I think, in Brazil, just because uh, the audience was big enough for us to test it. And they kind of, they speak a different language, so they won't communicate a lot with the English speaking audience. So it was okay for us to do that. So, uh, we did not want uh, those uh, soft launch testers to, um, to spoil the feature for everyone in the world. But it was actually a very rare case. And this soft launch was probably more technical rather than actually analyzing the feature. It was more technical to be sure this uh, the system works. Uh, there are no, not a lot of bugs to be fixed. So we were reluctant to launch it on the whole market at the same time. So we tried it as a soft launch. Uh, so sometimes it happens, but it is very hard to perform. It kind of takes a lot of work. So and we try not to do that. Usually uh, when the feature is kind of normal, it is not something completely new for the company in general. We just release it uh, maybe in the form of A-B test, but uh, it can be released in the, in a small A/B test, but it's not about the market. It's about just taking a small part of the audience and giving them the feature. It can be done as well. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, as I said, it is kind of okay to release the feature if it is a little less, if, if it has a little less quality than was expected. And it is, also, it is also okay to sometimes return to the concept or even to the initial idea. Sometimes during the development, we just realize that the feature is not working, that it is not something that will improve the game. It looked like, like it was gonna improve the game, but we we're not kind of sure, or maybe we even were sure, but realized that it's not the thing here. And sometimes we just uh, return to the initial idea or even abandon the feature altogether because it's it kind of it's kind of hard to do that when you are invested in the feature. But if you have a big team, if you have an opportunity to try a lot of different things at the same time, you can abandon some of them in the process. It is also okay. And the kind of the last thing, maybe the last I wanted to talk to you about is just how to come up with ideas, how we do that. And maybe this last slide would be the most game design slide of all the presentation perhaps, but it is also for some people the most controversial because what is original 
where do you take ideas from? And most of the time, in fact, all the ideas come from other games. And I wanted to stress this specifically, that it is, some people call it stealing, but in fact, there is no such thing as original idea. I've uh, noted this um, podcast I listened a couple of years ago on TED Radio Hour called, called What is Original? You should definitely uh, listen to that if you, are, if you think that original ideas exist. Uh, there is this phrase, I think, from South Park. Simpsons already did it. You just don't know it. Because sometimes you might think something is new. You came up with an idea which is completely new. You have never seen it anywhere. And you're sure nobody ever has. But in fact, Simpsons or someone else already did it. Uh, and you realize it only after you get first reviews from players, for example. And the, the third statement is experiments in big commercial project is always a bad idea. If you think of any commercial project, any big game on the market, you will never find them experimenting. Like literally never. Every new feature they release, they got it from some other game. Either this, either their own game that probably was soft launched, or they got it from other uh, successful project. But it's also a kind of a mashup of different ideas. So when you are trying to come up with uh, a new idea, trying to focus on creating something entirely new, uh, sometimes it's better just to embrace the fact that you need to be kind of uh, embrace the influence you get from other places. So just play more and get working ideas elsewhere. Then reinvent them in your project and do it better because you can always find some interesting things on in other projects and make them better. Uh, the One of the examples I wanted to bring here about whether something is original is this uh, feature of uh, Battle Pass, Gold Pass, Season Pass, whatever. Uh, during this year and the previous one, all of our games got this Gold Pass thing. And kind of we were highly influenced by um, games by Supercell and King. And you got to understand that they got it from probably Fortnite and Fortnite, which became very popular and got a lot of money through Gold Pass, Battle Pass system. And they got it from Dota 2 actually, and Dota 2 got it from uh, PlayStation system of season passes that sell uh, games. Like you can you get the access to all the additional uh, stuff on the games after the release. And they got it from, uh, I think, sport stadiums where they sell season passes for sport events. Like, and you kind of can buy the season pass for a series of games. So everyone are always taking something from somewhere else. And it's probably a bad thing to try to come up with something original. Just take ideas elsewhere. That's my takeaway from this slide. Um, but maybe we can discuss it if you have questions about it. So basically, that's it. That's what I wanted to talk to you about today uh, in the time frame we had initially set. As I've said, it's, it's, uh, it's a long story to talk about game design, and especially match three. So you can feel free to contact me if you want to ask me anything. I don't use Facebook a lot, mostly for games, <laughs> mostly to connect myself with and save my game progress, but feel free. Uh, thank you, Dmitry, so much uh, for your time and for deciding in the first place to, to join us here today. 
um, <clears throat> I think uh, in this time frame, uh, this is the, the best we could do. I think you had a lot of uh, specific information and a lot of useful advice. Uh, we have uh, some questions uh, still remaining in the QA section. Uh, so let's uh, start a bit wider so you can uh, relax from your presentation. Um, in short, uh, we would call the Serbian gaming industry fairly new in terms of the, the long time frame. If we say that the gaming industry uh, started, let's say, 60 years ago, uh, the majority of the teams here in Serbia opened up, let's say, 10 years ago. Uh, we have a lot of uh, extremely talented artists and um, and developers, but what we uh, in the Serbian Games Association uh, found out through constant conversations with our members in the community, uh, game design is something that is uh, lacking the most, I would say. Uh, so I'm guessing most of the people uh, who are here today are actually uh, planning to enter the industry and to start uh, game design. So considering that you cannot, for example, you know, produce, uh, actually program your own little project or uh, make an art portfolio, how do you uh, kick things off for yourself if you want to enter the industry as a game designer? How do you develop your skills? Where do you start? Mm -hmm. Actually, I would say I know a lot of game, game designers who came in the industry starting as a QA specialist. So at first, they just uh, work for other companies testing the games. They get the understanding of how the game operates, and not only how the game operates, but also how the production happens. So it's probably one of the best way to enter if you don't have experience at all. Or I don't agree that you cannot, able, you cannot uh, create a game on your own. I think uh, there are lots of ways actually nowadays to make a game. Uh, there are lots of uh, engines you can use to make uh, some prototypes, even the simple ones. Uh, I have this example. One of my colleagues actually taught his parents to make a game to make games. So they were never they were kind of like uh, all parents, all, all the people have maybe even rarely using phones, not even computers, but they were able not only to learn how to use a computer, but also how to make a game. It's a great example, actually. And I think they even released a couple of games on Steam with his help, of course, with the help of his of their son, but it's still possible. I mean, you can try in this area, though it requires a bit more skill and a bit more uh, learning. Great, I think uh, that's good advice. Uh, I'm just uh, sifting through the questions to see if there's anything of a more general nature. Uh, for example, uh, it's an anonymous question. Uh, is there any advice for um, people who are new to game design? And I would co connect that to another question. Do you have any specific design principles that you uh, personally follow? Maybe uh, psychology that is often used or any techniques? Well, uh, I always follow one simple principle to always play your game and uh, to play the games made by competitors, of course. So it's definitely the starting point for every game designer to gain the, uh, the understanding of the games. And yeah, as I've said, personally, I always play Gardenscapes when I'm designing it. Before that, I designed Township and I always played it. No, I don't because I'm kind of fed up with it. Um, but it was, uh, I had, I think, three different accounts that were kind of uh, developed from the scratch. So uh, that's kind of principle I'm looking at always. Always play what you're making. Mm, great. Uh, and um, is there any uh, literature or any educational resources that people can find online that you would recommend? Mm, yeah, it's interesting. I, I always thought like uh, some people ask if uh, you can be taught a game design in a university or anything. I think there are courses in the universities nowadays that teach game design, but I'm not sure if it's whether it, it's worth it. 
because I think the game designer is a person who just knows a lot of, in different spheres. So probably you should just uh, try to learn more about the way the movies are made, for example, the way the story is being made, uh, the way, yeah, learn something about psychology, def def definitely. The psychology of the player. There is a the book I am trying to read <laughs> right now. I'm struggling with it. It's called uh, Players Making Decisions. It's kind of uh, partly behavioral economy, partly psychology. So it deals with the, this way this, uh, the players are making decisions. Though like, uh, making decisions is uh, to general term. There is an old book, I think, the game design book of lenses it's called uh yeah actually uh everyone in the chat section recommended that mm -hmm. so you you vouched mm -hmm. that it's good yeah yeah, yeah. I, I i haven't read it completely but like 80 and 90 percent because some of the things are just too obvious for me and i skipped them <laughs> but uh, for the for the beginners it's definitely good and mm -hmm. well in general you can just uh, look for any bestseller uh, titled game design. So if a lot of people bought it, if, if, if it has a lot of positive uh, feedback, it's definitely worth taking a look at. Great. Uh, let's delve into more specific questions. Uh, there is one for, for, from Stanislav. Uh, how do you decide on uh, release schedule and the scope of each release, uh, given that you often shuffle features from one release to the next? Mm -hmm. uh, right now we have a, I think a six week, weeks updates, which means that uh, a submit is happening every six weeks or five. I don't quite remember, but um, we have this concept of making features that are not tied to an update. So for example, some teams are always working on some features that were not scheduled yet. And uh, at some point during the review, we decide that the feature is ready and we can schedule it for the nearest update or the next one, depending on whether it has a window or whether some update needs new feature because a lot of others were canceled or postponed. So, uh, having a big team, it's a bit easier, and it is not it is not necessary for us to release a certain amount of features in one update. It can be like five here, six there, so there is no strict rule about that. So yeah, I think the basic rules are we have features developed without the attachment to the update, and it is okay to shuffle them. Uh, great, thank you. And you actually uh, gave an introduction to another question that I wanted to read from uh, Svetislav. Uh, how big was the Playrix team when you joined? Uh, and uh, I'm guessing uh, the, the follow-up to this could be um, how the design process changed uh, when you increased the number of team members. Mm -hmm. When I joined, the team was only 70 or 80 people. Uh, they all worked in the same workplace in Vologda, the birth town of Playrix. And uh, kind of since that, as far as I remember, it was always increasing. And like this increase goes exponentially. I remember hitting the 100, 200, 500,000. Now it's just 2,000. I think the company now has 2,050 people. So it's constantly growing and the processes, the procedures change almost every year. <laughs> it is okay. I'm just not, I'm just thinking of it as something to get used to, to, to always be ready to get used to something new. <laughs> so, um, and yeah, so, I mean, uh, as I've said, I've been here for 10 years and I would, I would think of it as working for several different companies just because the the magnitude always increased. 
at one point it was a small team of 70 people working only on downloadable games and i remember the first project i worked on it had only five people kind of five or six of them and we managed to release it and to make it in just one year and release it so so, so you were there for the uh, first version of gardenscapes uh, not first one, actually. The very, very first one happened a couple of years before I joined it. But uh, I was there for the second Gardenscapes and the first uh, DLC. Well, mm. it's not a DLC. It's kind of a spin-off. It was called Mansion Makeover, I think. Uh, I'm so, asking because we have another question from Mishka uh, who wanted to know uh, how did this first version or in this case second because that's the one you are familiar with uh, different from the game that it, it is today. Uh, how many features uh, were added later? Are there any core features that are still there? Uh, first, Gardenscapes were downloadable games for PC. So it's the biggest difference. <laughs> and also the second biggest difference was that all previous garden escapes is before the one you have in stores right now, they were hidden object games. So we had games like garden escapes with meta and everything and the match, match three above it, but all the garden escapes were hidden objects. And this is the first match three we have. Okay, thank you. And um, I don't know if you are um, actually uh, able to talk about these things, but uh, can you tell us if uh, you follow Scrum or Kanban or some other uh, sort of project management tools and processes at Playdix? Uh, I know that we don't follow anything specifically, like we, we, don't, we don't put labels on it. We have a certain management system that is a combination of everything that that there is. I think it's more like a Scrum, as far as I know. I've never actually studied Scrum. I just have a brief idea of what it is. So it's, it's a combination, it's nothing specific. We don't follow any books, like literally any kind of experience there are in the world. Mm -hmm. Understood. And uh, Mladen wanted to know why did you abandon the hidden object uh, idea in part of the game? Well, yeah, it's an interesting thing. It was a very hard decision for all of us, for most of us at least. Uh, I would say that at the moment we were making this game, we had only Township uh, in operation as a mobile game. So like we had Township and there were other downloadable games and we were making first uh, hidden object free to play mobile game Gardenscapes. At some point we released Fishdom. The Fishdom, which is also a match three game, but we released it before the Gardenscapes was over. So we tested a match three free to play game on mobile. And we realized that it's working. So kind of, we knew that it was working at this point. And we were not sure about hidden object. We were not sure that it, it, it is actually, it would actually be that successful that we want it to be. So I think uh, this was the biggest, uh, the biggest uh, kind of influence uh, releasing the match three and having, having already had an experience of releasing the match three game. And we decided just to switch to Metri because it was, we thought it was easier, although the whole process of switching was hard, but the development was easier than hidden object games. So at this point, we were not sure the hidden object would kick off and we were kind of sure much three works. But recently, uh, I don't know if you know, but I think we already released it, the hidden object game called Manor Matters. It was developed by one of our studios with our participation. So it actually is a hidden object, in, a free-to-play hidden object. In a way, the garden escapes was supposed to be. So uh, I think we learned something. We realized that it's worth trying doing that. So we switched, we 
went back to hidden object. Mm, so even abandoned ideas can uh, find a new life in, in another game, uh, which actually brings me to our next question from uh, Reza. Ha, or Reza. Uh, how do you start a new game uh, in your company or in general? How you decide you know, between 10 of these ideas we have uh, in front of ourselves, which is the one to go for? Uh, we have a team of experts who are constantly studying the market, first of all, and they kind of keep toying with different kinds of ideas. Every new game is always a combination of something. So uh, in our case, it's a combination of meta of any kind and some other genre as a core gameplay. So it's kind of we always have a huge pool of ideas to be tried if we have spare teams, spare resources. And it just happens based on the uh, analysis of the market and what we are ready to do right now. When we see a new project being released uh, by some other company that seems kind of promising, uh, and we had something out, something like that in mind already, we just know that using our expertise in releasing games in marketing them we can make this game better and just go for it makes perfect sense and also uh a couple of people asked uh if you could state uh any games that are good as a game design uh resource in terms of you know like a, a good example of a good game design, but obviously not from Playrix. Uh, it depends on <laughs> in what sphere, like in well, AAA, uh, let's, in AAA let's stick to mobile. Uh, definitely to mm -hmm. mobile. I'm guessing the majority of people here are uh, for, for that. Mm -hmm. um, well, uh, it's always a good idea just to look at games that are being operated by the most successful companies, obviously. Supercell, King, companies like that, uh, Vuga also. So, mm, so I, I mean, almost always those games have good game design. Uh, although some projects, uh, they lack something and they get closed every once in a while. Uh, personally, uh, mm -hmm, yeah, yeah. Uh, personally, I mean, I've been playing for the last two or three years, I think two years. Uh, it's uh, not It's not a casual game. It's a uh, collectible game called Star Wars Galaxy of Heroes. It's just very good in terms of game design, I think, personally. But it's just a little bit different from what we do. Like, it's not a casual one. But uh, the more I play it, the more I get this uh, feeling of these, the approach of game design they have. And I notice all the haters on the internet that hate every update they release. And being a game designer, I perfectly realize that each update has a perfect sense for me as a game designer. Like, it's just good. Everyone hated, but all the, the revenue goes up. It all works perfect. So it's mm -hmm. one of the games I would kind of note. <laughs> Great, and thank you. Uh, so we were talking about, um, let's say, uh, borrowing ideas uh, that are already there, but I guess the same goes for uh, design concepts. So do you, for example, use any AAA concepts, uh, like, for example, the design core pillars, uh, to gauge what the core elements are of the game and what, the, what features should be produced? Uh, or is it completely different uh, when it comes to mobile games? I would definitely say that a good game designer can look at certain parts of the game, including the AAA game, as a mechanics, not as a concrete representation of this mechanics. So you can think of how to turn something from a AAA project into mobile. It is definitely doable and you should definitely try it. I cannot uh, think of, I cannot come up with good examples like straight away, but I remember personally, I tried a lot with uh, to implement something from other games I played. 
definitely you can do if you do games about narrative you can take a lot from the narrative based games the, it is definitely a good thing i mean you should be looking at every game you play uh, also on AAA games as a set of mechanics not just not, not to focus on the game itself but trying to think of how it actually operates how it works why it works this way why like Kojima created something in his new game. You can probably implement, you can boil it down to the essentials and trying to implement it in your game. It's worth looking at. Cool. And uh, since we were talking about, uh, let's say, good examples of a game design in terms of games, are there any uh, colleagues and fellow game designers whose work you really admire? And uh, would you recommend uh, our viewers here tonight to look up their presentations or uh, tutorials or something? Uh, I remember repeatedly watching to a few uh, presentations made by Sid Meier. He had a few on TVC throughout the years, and uh, especially ones about balancing I really liked the way he described how he balanced uh, the civilization. Mm, that's, yeah, that's one thing that I can think mm. of straight away. Uh, other presentations, I don't know. I actually don't think there are lots of, uh, lots of kind of icons in game design. <laughs> I can think of, yeah, Kojima, of course, but he doesn't, he doesn't speak English well, so he doesn't have presentations. Uh, yeah, I think Sid Meier yeah, would yeah, be my, that, my that's, one choice. That's fine for now. And of course, he's the, the prime example. Uh, so I will ask you just one last question. Unfortunately, we have uh, several left unanswered, but uh, we don't have enough time uh, this time. Uh, so this is a perfect closing question uh, from Behnam. How do you find out when to kill a project? We never kill the project. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, we had a couple. We have. Uh... Or a feature in that case. Yeah, okay. To kill a feature, we just look at how it performs. We look at analytics and we realize that this feature doesn't bring in it anything new in the game and anything worth keeping in the game. So uh, it might be just. We had such features. We even have them right now. We are struggling to uh, understand whether to keep them or not. But yeah, basically it's just the analytics. We don't see any any impact this feature has, and so we decide just why why keeping it. And uh, speaking of projects, uh, I think we have had one project we tried hard to release. We soft launched it a couple of times, and uh, we abandoned it two or three times and yet still we sometimes think of maybe reviving it. So it's always about just looking at numbers actually. It's the perfect yeah, way. Yeah, numbers to... don't lie. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dmitry, so much again on the behalf of the SGA. And a big, big thanks goes to uh, Playrix uh, RS from Novi Sad, who helped us organize this. Uh, so in case you were late to join us, uh, no worries. The presentation will be uploaded online. Uh, you can subscribe on our YouTube channel. Uh, it is actually here in the chat. Uh, I uh, pasted the link for you. And also you can find an invite link for our Discord community uh, where you can uh, chat with uh, fellow uh, people, professionals from the gaming industry. We have uh, a really strong community there of around 700 professionals already who are very active uh, daily and talk about all sorts of topics. Uh, so there you can also reach me if you have any follow-up questions. Uh, here uh, up on the screen, you have uh, contact details for Dmitry. Uh, and I'm guessing the presentation as well will be uh, linked in the description of the YouTube video if uh, Playrix approved that it's okay to post it online. They did. Great. Uh, so thank you again, Mitri, so much. Hopefully we will see you maybe in person uh, uh, sometime next year if, if things get better. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us and we are looking forward to all future SGA events. Uh, follow us on social media to stay tuned. Bye-bye.
Yeah, thank you guys. Bye bye.